Remember when every bar and restaurant was filled with the toxic fumes of cigarettes? If you're under the age of 35, you probably don't, and your lungs thank you for it. The world decided a long time ago that cigarettes were awful, even though Philip Morris assured us otherwise for decades. And now, in addition to smoking being banned from most establishments, rates of smoking have never been lower. That being said, smoking is still somewhat prevalent, though it's quickly becoming surpassed by the as-yet-not-long-term tested practice of vaping, which we are sure will have no negative effects whatsoever. Popcorn lung sounds like tons of fun. Almost all of the above contain the same addictive substance, nicotine. So why, despite knowing how bad nicotine is, are people still hooked? Why does it still have such a hold on so many people? And why do some people say that quitting smoking can be more difficult than quitting heroin? Well, we looked at exactly what nicotine does to the body by reading up on studies, researching for hours, and of course, going on a microscopic voyage through the veins. Let's check it out. Compared to other substances, nicotine might not seem that strong a chemical. After all, cigarette smokers don't generally look or act visibly high after having a cigarette. Whatever effects it has on the brain and body, it seems like they're not at all that pronounced. And that would be an understandable, yet wildly incorrect conclusion to draw from observing, or heck, even being a smoker. First off, it's important to note that you can actually ingest nicotine without smoking cigarettes. Smokeless tobacco products, such as chewing tobacco and dip, also contain nicotine. For those trying to quit, the nicotine patches they use to help overcome their addiction also have, as indicated by the name, significant levels of the substance. But let's just say you inhale nicotine in perhaps its most popular form via smoking. What happens to your body right after that? When you inhale, the nicotine is extracted and goes straight to your lungs, riding on the back of those smoke particles. As soon as it gets there, it's absorbed into the pulmonary circulation system, which connects the heart and the lungs. Part of the reason why nicotine spreads so quickly throughout the human body is that the substance is generally ingested in its alkaline state, meaning that it has a high pH. You can use this little tidbit the next time your friend tells you that they only eat and drink alkalized food and water now because they're trying to be healthy. In its alkaline form, nicotine is non-ionized, meaning that it can easily cross a lot of membranes and other various borders of the body and brain. This is how it so easily seeps into your lungs and skin. Then the nicotine spreads out into your arteries, where it makes its way straight to your brain, ready to wreak havoc. There it seeks out a specific set of structures known as nicotinic cholinergic receptors. The scientific abbreviation for these is NACHRs, which might be a more difficult abbreviation to remember and pronounce than the actual full words, rendering the shortening absolutely useless. These NACHR receptors work like chemically controlled channels. When an incoming chemical that fits on its surface can bind to it, it'll open or close the gate that allows sodium, potassium, and some calcium to pass through. In the absence of nicotine, those receptors usually bind with acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter often associated with attention, memory, and learning. That is why one of the very, very few benefits of nicotine may be increased levels of alertness and improved concentration and memory. However, this holds true for adults. When teenagers smoke, this part of their brain is still developing, meaning memory and focus can actually get stunted well into adulthood. In conjunction with screen time and ADHD diagnoses going through the roof these days, that's probably an area of the brain that needs no additional stunting. There's also the fact that 8 million people die of tobacco use every year, so perhaps just have a cup of tea or meditate in the mornings instead. Same positive effect on focus, less cancer. Nicotine opens this receptor gate, allowing sodium and calcium to flood through to your neurons. This causes transmitters to be released into your body, including dopamine, i.e. the feel-good hormone. The reason dopamine bears this nickname is because it makes people happy. From an evolutionary standpoint, dopamine is meant to reward you every time you accomplish something essential to your survival – eating, drinking, finding resources, and securing a mate. Unfortunately, a lot of our modern society has created shortcuts for dopamine release that end up resulting in addictive behaviors. The reason why people love eating sugar, scrolling social media apps, and even, yes, smoking, is because of the constant hits of dopamine these activities trigger. This dopamine release might also be part of the reason why people with depression have a higher chance of being smokers. The correlation also holds for schizophrenia, PTSD, and other types of mental illness. People suffering from depression have low dopamine levels, which the constant release of dopamine from cigarettes might ameliorate in the moment. In this way, the relieving feel-good properties of nicotine can be temporarily used as self-medication, but at the expense of years of your life. 
But there are countless other factors besides nicotine use that can interfere with your happiness or prevent you from achieving your goals. Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who's going through a hard time, therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible, and this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com infographics. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost, without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash infographics. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. Now, as we were saying, nicotine use is also associated with alcohol and drug use, as people tend to get addicted to more than one substance. Smokers will usually tell you that alcohol use is a big trigger for cravings, as is caffeine use. Now, the way your receptors are designed might also play a role in how susceptible you are to cigarette addiction. One particular receptor subunit, alpha-4, was found to greatly determine how responsive your brain is to nicotine. A single mutation could make this subunit incredibly sensitive, increasing your chances of strong addiction. Genetic factors like those, coupled with environmental factors, such as growing up with parents who smoke, make it more likely someone will develop a nicotine addiction. The best way to avoid this is to never try any products containing nicotine in the first place, so you don't have to find out the hard way if you've won this terrible genetic game or not. That being said, no matter what genetic mutations you carry, nicotine will still have a lot of powerful effects on your body, and some of them may be in opposition to each other, as unlike many other drugs, nicotine functions as both a sedative and a stimulant. The latter effect comes from yet another chemical release of nicotine, adrenaline. After it enters your system and spreads throughout your bloodstream, nicotine hits the adrenal glands, located right above your kidneys. The adrenal glands, for the 99% of us who forgot all of our high school science classes upon graduation, produce a wide range of hormones that help regulate the body. These hormones will affect your metabolism, your immune system, your blood pressure, stress response, and a whole host of other necessary functions. When nicotine reaches these glands, they're prompted to release more of their main hormone, adrenaline. This results in increased blood pressure, rapid breathing, and a higher heart rate. However, adrenaline also creates a lot of positive, happy feelings in a person. You probably know a little bit about adrenaline already, as it's the hormone that gets released whenever you suddenly get stressed or scared. Whether it's because a tiger is running toward you at full speed, or you have four deadlines approaching tomorrow and a half day left to meet them, adrenaline generally kicks your body into high gear. The problem is, when adrenaline is artificially increased throughout your system on a constant basis, it eventually changes your stress response. Funnily enough, though many smokers claim they smoke cigarettes to help relieve stress, long-term nicotine addiction actually increases your general stress levels. One study by Professor Parrott, an American psychologist, found adolescent smokers report increasing levels of stress as they develop regular patterns of smoking, and smoking cessation leads to reduced stress. Though people believe they're using cigarettes to relax, what they're actually doing is alleviating the start of withdrawal symptoms. This is evident in the fact that daily moods of smokers reflect a pattern of normal moods during smoking and worsening moods between cigarettes. It's the reason why people rapidly puffing outside on their 5-minute smoke break don't generally look all that relaxed. They're not achieving zen with that cigarette, they're feeding their addiction to simply remain in a stable state of mind. In addition to causing stimulant effects of nicotine, adrenaline also creates some strange effects like decreasing insulin production, making blood sugar levels in the body rise. This might explain why prolonged use of nicotine increases people's chance of developing type 2 diabetes by 30 to 40 percent, according to the CDC. As you'll soon see, nicotine really does cover a whole wide range of terrible things that can happen to you later in life. So, now that the stimulant effect has been explained, what about the opposite? The sedative effect comes from a combination of dopamine and yet another hormone that nicotine releases, beta endorphins. 
Depending on what dose you take or how much you smoke, nicotine can release beta endorphins into your system. Those hormones reduce anxiety and generally make you feel better. Since beta endorphins are more dose dependent, that might explain why longer term smokers or people who smoke throughout the day initially get a kick and related dizziness from nicotine, but eventually feel calmed by using it. The sheer amount of negative effects experienced as a side effect of this consumption, however, are staggering. Prolonged nicotine use starts to dysregulate and artificialize your hormone production, meaning that you're getting rewarded with dopamine hits for doing absolutely nothing good and experiencing an adrenaline rush without a threat. In addition, the substance is continuously causing opposing experiences in your body, as sedation is coupled with stimulation. This leads to a variety of short and long-term symptoms. Dizziness and lightheadedness are some of the initial symptoms, palpable even after your first puff. This happens because your arteries get restricted and blood flow gets affected. Later on, you'll likely experience worsening sleep, with your body unable to fully rest and go through this sleep stage peacefully. Nicotine also negatively affects your digestive and larger gastrointestinal system. The many fun experiences you can have thanks to using this substance include diarrhea, heartburn, indigestion, and ulcers. However, the heart gets the brunt of it, and not in a good way. In addition to elevating your vitals, nicotine also makes your arteries narrow and can make the walls of the arteries harder. This creates prime conditions for myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. Also otherwise known as the reason your doctor would like you to get your act together and quit. A combination of hardened arteries and increased blood pressure skyrockets your chances of having a stroke as well. Strokes are often caused by blocked arteries, and hard, narrow arteries are more susceptible to blockage, not to mention that high blood pressure damages arteries and can even cause blood clots which lead to arterial blockage. You're also more likely to develop blood clots in general, blood pressure aside, and arthrosclerosis, which is when fatty materials partially or fully block your arteries. All of this, as you might imagine, is generally kind of bad regarding blood getting to all your organs in a timely and orderly fashion. And without blood, your body and organs generally don't do too well, which is why long-term smokers may often experience numbness in their extremities, and even longer-term smokers can experience heart failure. At this point, you might be thinking, if nicotine's so bad, why are nicotine patches recommended to help smokers quit? Isn't it just as horrible for their bodies? Well, first of all, nicotine patches are meant for temporary use, not for life. The exception is for some extra addicted smokers, who use them not for quitting but rather as a way to make it through long plane flights. After all, flight attendants don't look too kindly on you lighting up in the aisle seat. The patches are meant to deliver lower and lower doses of nicotine over time so ex-smokers can wean themselves off of the primary addictive substance of cigarettes without experiencing bad withdrawal symptoms and relapses. However, nicotine itself is also not quite as strongly carcinogenic as cigarette smoke is. In fact, many experts, including Cancer Research UK, state that nicotine on its own doesn't cause cancer at all and continue to espouse the benefits of nicotine replacement therapy for smokers. Though once again, they believe in replacement therapy as a temporary measure, not a lifetime of compulsively covering your body with nicotine patches every time there's a crisis at work. A few studies disagree with this conclusion and claim that nicotine can enable cancer development. But overall, scientists and doctors agree that the biggest cancer risk from cigarettes comes not from nicotine, but from all the other carcinogenic chemicals contained in cigarettes. So when a smoker switches to nicotine patches to help them quit, they immediately start reducing their risk of cancer, and can eventually get off the patch to reduce the chances of anything else bad happening to them as well. However, doctors aren't on board with every product currently marketed as a cigarette replacement. Though nicotine is most commonly associated with cigarettes, its presence in increasingly popular vapes and e-cigarettes has doctors worried. Not a lot of long-term studies have been conducted on vaping, thanks to the fact that it's a relatively new product. However, the ones that have looked at short-term effects see a lot of the same issues found in cigarette smokers, including increased heart rate and blood pressure. The population assessment of the Tobacco and Health Study found an increased incident of pulmonary diseases in current and former vapors as well. Many e-cigarettes were originally sold as a temporary replacement for cigarettes, to help users wean off of cigarettes and eventually stop smoking. For this reason, one commonly believed myth is that vapes don't contain all the other toxic chemicals cigarettes do. 
However, e-cigarette liquids can contain several toxic chemicals generally found in cigarettes, including formaldehyde used to manufacture building materials, cadmium used to make batteries, and arsenic historically used to poison wayward husbands and rulers that you wish to overthrow. A lot of the flavoring agents used in vapes, especially those marketed to youngsters, also contain carcinogenic chemicals. And though vapes are supposed to help former smokers quit, their use among people who never smoked cigarettes in their life is rapidly increasing. In 2016, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System showed that 1.2 million U.S. adults who had never smoked regular cigarettes were now vaping. Giving people yet another path to nicotine addiction and its resulting health issues isn't all that much of a social improvement. The level of nicotine vaping actually delivers is also up in the air. Some studies claim that vaping delivers lower levels of nicotine into your body, while others say you inhale a larger dose of nicotine by vaping rather than smoking. The fact that the concentration of nicotine in each vape isn't really regulated doesn't help conduct such studies and help them agree on a reliable conclusion. At the end of the day, scientific results so far have been mixed, but the one thing all scientists can agree on is that avoiding nicotine altogether is the best way to go. Now that we've seen what nicotine does to your body when inhaled and in how many forms it can be ingested, we need to examine the next pressing question, why do people become so addicted? And most importantly, why is it so hard to quit? After all, it's not that smokers don't know the harmful effects or don't want to quit. In fact, according to Dr. Benowitz's paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, 70% of smokers say they would like to quit, and every year 40% do quit for at least one day. Yet each year only 3% of smokers quit successfully. Perhaps that's because withdrawal starts pretty soon after that last cigarette was smoked and lasts longer than most people trying to quit anticipate. After being inhaled, nicotine stays in your body for anywhere between 6 to 8 hours. However, one weird phenomenon with the substance is that the more often you smoke, the longer it'll take nicotine to completely leave your body. Other factors such as advanced age will also make nicotine linger longer in your body. The half-time of nicotine in plasma, the primary component of blood, is about 2 hours. Most nicotine, around 80%, is metabolized in your liver and produces continine as a byproduct. This will remain in your system for approximately 10 days, so someone could theoretically test you now to see if you've had a cigarette less than 10 days ago, but nicotine will be gone. Therefore, some withdrawal symptoms start as the nicotine clears out of someone's system. However, withdrawal usually lasts for over a month. If the nicotine has been completely cleared out weeks before that, why does withdrawal last so long? Well, when you've been using nicotine for some time, it'll actually start to alter how your brain works. The receptors we talked about, the NACHRs, actually start increasing in number the longer you use nicotine. We're not talking about just a few more here and there. The Mayo Clinic says that addicted smokers have billions more of these receptors than non-smokers do. So when someone tries to quit smoking, all these billions of receptors are suddenly left without the substance that was activating them, and they start screaming for more. This might also be the reason why smokers experience various levels of addiction and degrees of difficulty in quitting. Scientists have found that all smokers have more NACHRs than non-smokers. The degree to which they have more receptors varies wildly from person to person. People with fewer receptors seem to be less addicted and find quitting easier. That being said, even mildly addicted smokers will likely experience some symptoms. When nicotine starts to leave a smoker's body, their dopamine levels drop and they start craving another dopamine hit. If they don't get that hit, dopamine levels continue to plummet, and the brain, which has been used to getting artificial hits of dopamine, adrenaline, and beta endorphins, all day suddenly is thrown completely out of whack. Not to mention that the cravings smokers refer to can be as psychologically caused as they are physical. Some smokers will feel cravings right after smoking what they deem to be their last cigarette, when clearly their body hasn't had the time to enter withdrawal yet. A lot of environmental and other triggers will usually make the cravings worse, including alcohol, being around smokers, or being in environments where people were used to taking smoke breaks, like bars. Part of the reason it's so hard to quit is that it's hard for smokers to completely avoid all these environments, and thus those triggers. People trying to quit smoking will often have to cut out alcohol or coffee or other significant cravings for a month and avoid going out to the environments where they would usually smoke. 
However, this isn't always possible. If people are around family members or co-workers who smoke, or have associated smoke breaks with their place of work, or if they find they really need coffee to make up for the sleep deprivation and lack of focus that their withdrawal is causing, it can be hard to realistically avoid triggers, and these triggers will cause cravings that can send someone running to get their next pack. The good news is that those cravings generally don't last for more than a few minutes, so if people can distract themselves or focus on why they no longer want any part of smoking or nicotine, they can get through it okay. And as time goes on, those cravings will lessen in frequency and severity, though they might be quite bad for the first month or two. But as a smoker's hormonal profile flails about trying to recalibrate, they'll also experience a lot of changes in mood and sleep cycles. People who have just quit smoking tend to be irritable, anxious, and have a short temper. As they stop getting their regular hits of adrenaline and dopamine, the cessation of chemicals binding to memory and concentration neurotransmitters, as well as the decrease of beta endorphins flooding their system, will likely make concentration, not to mention a peaceful night of uninterrupted sleep, way more difficult for someone in the beginning stages of withdrawal to achieve. As nicotine affects insulin production, the first few weeks of withdrawal can also include increased appetite and weight gain. A fair amount of this might be caused by the oral fixation left over from constantly smoking as ex-smokers find the need to replace the stick that they were constantly putting in their mouth with something. So instead of snacking all day as a replacement, perhaps carry around a bottle of water and hydrate instead. This will provide a bonus of enabling the liver and kidneys to function better and flush the leftover cigarette toxins out of your body's system more rapidly. Other possible withdrawal symptoms include dizziness, constipation, and even cold-like symptoms. A lot of smokers report a consistent cough for the first few weeks or even months of quitting even worse than the general smoker's cough associated with those who smoke. This is likely just your body expelling all the horrible chemicals and tar it ingested over time, and it'll subside after a while. At this point, you might be thinking, these may sound like relatively tame symptoms overall. After all, no one is shuddering uncontrollably in a corner, offering to sell their house to a dealer for one more Marlboro Light. But for a lot of people, the constant moodiness, the lack of sleep and concentration, Feelings of lethargy, weight gain, and intense cravings and agitation can be too much to handle. Couple that with being unable to remove yourself from situations that trigger your cravings, and a lot of ex-smokers and nicotine users fail at this stage. Before entering the withdrawal process, it's also important to understand why a nicotine addiction has taken hold of someone in the first place, to give smokers the best chance of succeeding and quitting. For example, for people suffering from depression or other mental health disorders who were using smoking to self-medicate, the sudden lack of artificially produced dopamine may worsen their symptoms and make sticking to quitting even harder. That's why it's always recommended that nicotine users talk to their doctor about a long-term plan before quitting to give people a good shot at sticking to their new identity as ex-smokers. Best of all, their bodies will quickly and also eventually thank them for this decision. Within just one day of quitting, your heart rate slows down and blood pressure returns to near normal levels. Oxygen flow throughout the body will improve as well. In the first few months of quitting, ex-smokers also tend to experience better blood circulation and immune function, so they won't be getting sick nearly as often. Their lungs will also be operating more efficiently, removing tar, dust, and other contaminants from their lining. In six months, stress levels drop, and in one year, breathing will be significantly easier. At this point, it's important to note that all withdrawal facts concerning lung function pertain mostly to cigarette smokers and vapors, as cigar smokers don't really inhale the smoke, and those who use smokeless tobacco products don't get that much nicotine in their lungs. Then as time goes on, within a matter of years, the overall risks of heart attack, stroke, and multiple cancers all start to plummet, with some returning to the average level of non-smokers. The effects nicotine has on a person's system are complex and intense and make quitting a challenge for many smokers and vapors. Quitting nicotine often causes initial feelings of depression and anxiety, as well as stress, that many users have been primed to cure via the nicotine use. Though the substance doesn't really help or address those underlying problems in any real way. This is perhaps why, in 1988, the Surgeon General declared nicotine to be as addictive as cocaine or heroin. Quitting all these substances creates difficult physical and mental experiences in a person's body that the brain is convinced only a return to those substances can alleviate. However, as addictive as nicotine is as a substance, any addiction can be broken. Just ask the millions of ex-smokers living oxygen-rich, coughless, and overall less smelly lives. 
Now that we covered all the reasons nicotine is a terrible addictive substance and exactly what it does to your body, check out what happens to your body when you do cocaine, or watch this video instead.